Hi everyone, uh, this is Cooper Knowlton and Lee Bergstein, and this is another BFK in brief. Um, we're hopping on here tonight because we wanted to give you a brief uh, explanation of a recent decision that was handed down in the, it was the commercial division in New York, is that right, Lee? Yep. Yep. And uh, so this is a case that we've, we've talked about a couple times previously on, uh, on our video series. Uh, this case involves Gap, um, who was the plaintiff, is the plaintiff in an action, and they filed an action in Supreme Court in New York uh, seeking a declaration saying that their lease uh, was no longer valid or their lease was terminated as a result of uh, the COVID pandemic and the uh, ensuing government orders. Um, so recently Gap filed a Yellowstone injunction um, which essentially uh, tolls the period that they have to, uh, to, to cure their alleged breach. Um, and this Yellowstone injunction was, was just ruled upon um, by a judge in New York. And we thought we'd give a brief, uh, Lee's gonna share a couple quick thoughts on uh, what the judge said and what the implications are uh, of the judge's decision. Yeah, so, um... You know, not not any major news, but you know, we're looking for any uh, anything that kind of impacts our clients' uh, respective rights and liabilities right now. And Gap is one of the cases that we've been keeping an eye on. So this is not a ruling as to the ultimate issue of the case. You know, Gap's theory of the case was that the purpose of the lease had been frustrated, but that's not what was at issue in this motion. They were seeking a Yellowstone injunction, and um, the, the defendant, the landlord, was opposing on, on several grounds. Some of them were procedural. Um, Gap was also asking to not have to submit an undertaking or you know, post a bond to secure uh, arrears for May and June rent. And obviously that was important to the landlord. And that's really the piece of, of the motion that we were looking at. Was the court going to require them to um, post an undertaking, which is fairly typical uh, in the context of Yellowstone injunctions. But here we're talking about, you know, millions of dollars in an undertaking. Uh, so more significant than perhaps other, other uh, types of leases. Gap obviously has a huge property with a very um, expensive lease in, in a prime location. And what the court ultimately decided was uh, Yellowstone injunction was granted. Um, you know, they met all of the parameters of uh, all the requirements to receive a Yellowstone injunction, but they also required that gap post undertaking for May and June rent. And what's significant and what many landlords are pretty happy about is the court went so far as to kind of assign a, a number to what that undertaking should be. And it, they said it should be uh, July rent with a 10% reduction to cover May and June. So, um, you know, I think we want to talk a little bit about the practical implications here um, and to kind of glean anything from the judge's thinking, um, we kind of look at the amount that the judge set as the undertaking. And it seems based on the number that the judge put forward that the judge values use and occupancy at market rate less 10%. This could have been an opportunity for the judge to say, um, it's too hard to determine what the market rate is given the ensuing pandemic. We're not gonna require an undertaking. That's not what happened here. So uh, it tends to, you know, I'm not gonna say definitely, but it tends to kind of showcase the judge's thinking with respect to whether or not, um, at least moving forward, the lease is valid. There might be a different perspective with respect to May and June when we were at the height of the pandemic and um, you know, th the store couldn't open at all. I think it's also significant to, to keep in mind that we are talking about a, a huge corporation like Gap. And I, and, and I think it's definitely significant that the judge was definitely, you know, when the, when the judge is, is asking the, the corporation to put up a, uh, you know, I believe it's a $5 million bond, um, you know, it's a little bit easier to ask a company like Gap to do that than, um, you know, a, a, a lot of the clients that we're working with. Um, who, who, you know, may not be able to pay a couple months rent because the, the business model has been so, so frustrated. So, um, you know, it is a little bit of a different scenario than, than a lot of the, the smaller tenants that, that we, we sometimes are chatting with. Sure. I mean, we're following Gap. We're following Notorious Secret. We're following those because those are the big Absolutely. Key. 
and uh, a lot of you know how landlords and tenants are going to proceed from a litigation perspective is going to depend on what happens in cases like that. But you're right, the the landlord in this case uh, made certain arguments with respect to the undertaking about GAP's financial viability, and clearly GAP is still financially viable. Sure, the pandemic has had a significant impact and then the same level has had an impact on every other retail tenant in New York City and all across the country. But um, unlike other smaller businesses that have one or two stores or you know even three or four locations uh, and really depend kind of on a month to month basis on the income they generate from those stores being open, um, GAP's a different animal. Uh, and uh, it is, you're right, it is possible that a court might look at it a different way if it was, for instance, you know, a mom and pop shop seeking a declaration and seeking you know, some injunction. There's no way to know. But, um, you know, what we can tell from this case is the court uh, is, is leaning towards, um, you know, saying that the, that the lease is uh, at least moving forward valid. I think there's an open question as to whether or not um, during those months where it just couldn't open, that's, you know, that's probably the best argument for sure. the um, but we don't know anything for sure. Um, there hasn't been a ruling with respect to liability. So a lot of this is speculation and trying to read into a very short order issued by the court. And we'll obviously continue to keep tabs on this case and other cases like it um, to kind of give everybody out there who's watching a, kind of a, a fast, real, real time view of what's going on in the commercial landscape. It does, it does seem like this case is moving quicker than a lot of the other ones. I saw there's a preliminary conference set for later this month. So um, I think the, the, the landlord tenant cases that are finding their way into Supreme Court, they're going to make an effort to move them a little bit faster than, for instance, you know, a breach of contract case that doesn't involve commercial property because every month the landlord's losing money, right. the tenant potentially could be on the hook for liability that doesn't know whether it is or not. So um, I think they are going to make an effort to move those cases a little bit faster, particularly in the commercial division where um, there are less, there's less of a caseload. Gotcha. All right. Well, thanks so much, Lee. Thanks, Cooper. Thanks for doing this after hours. <laughs> Take care.